so happy to be able to come here as a speaker. Um, and uh, you are not alone uh, in having an anthropologist for the first time talk about autism, because there are not a lot of anthropologists who do it. Now, why do I do the anthropology of autism? Because I have a child with autism, Isabel, who's pictured here. She doesn't like to be photographed head on. Um, here she is looking at the jellyfish in the Georgia Aquarium. Uh, and because I'm an anthropologist. And when she was diagnosed in 1993, people naturally asked me questions about what people did with autism among the Zulu, or what was the prevalence of autism in Bolivia, because they figured I knew. Of course, I didn't know. There has been really a dramatic change in the world of autism since Isabel was born. Her lifetime she's 21 now, has witnessed dramatic changes. Uh, let me just tell you two short anecdotes, because I, I think they're illustrative, and hopefully will not give you the impression that anthropologists are just about anecdotes, or that are the plural of, you know, the old joke, the plural of anecdote is data. Um, <laughs> but um, I was in South Africa, and I met a couple, a young, wonderful couple named Susanna and Golden Kumalo. And they have a little boy whose name is Big Boy. And uh, Big Boy seemed to be developing fine. But when he was about 18 months or close to two years of age, he lost the few words that he had had. All he did all day was to draw circles. Uh, the parents said that they were planets or marbles. And his parents put them all over their, their house. But they knew that there was something wrong. He stopped making eye contact. He really seemed to not engage with them. And so they decided that they would take him to a hospital in a major city a Western-style ho hospital, a major academic center. Well, the family flipped out. The parents of Susanna and Golden, Big Boy's grandparents, said, you can't take him to a Western hospital. This is a disease of the spirits, and you need to take him to an Inyanga, which would kind of translate as witch doctor. They were terrified, because they think witch doctors are cheaters. They think that they're fakes. They knew that if Big Boy went there, he would likely be given an emetic to vomit the evil inside of him, a laxative to expel the evil in his bowels, and he would be separated from them for two days. And they said no. But you know what? The Klan came down on them, and it was too big a crisis. And custom went out, and they brought Big Boy to the witch doctor. He was there for two very difficult days as the parents wondered what was happening to their son. After two days, they came and they got Big Boy, and the witch doctor said, I know what's wrong with Big Boy. He has autism. <laughs> nothing that they had ever heard of, and certainly nothing you would have expected him to say. He found out about it on the internet. <laughs> because the witch doctors get together once a month at a local church where they talk about what the things are going on in science, what's happening in the world. Well, the other story I want to tell you is about Isabel. We wanted her to volunteer at an animal lab. And so we brought her to the National Institutes of Health, where we thought that maybe she could. She loves animals. She's just incredibly she's obsessed with animals. That's her restricted and repetitive behavior, uh, is that she just wants to learn about animals. And we brought her to. Uh, the NIH lab to see if there was something she could do. She could clean cages. She could just be around animals. This is what would make her happy. And we just assumed that when we went there, we would be introduced to a supervisor who would show her where the, the um, closet was and where the bathroom was. But they had set up a seminar table, much like the one that's in this building, a large seminar table. And people came, and they were wearing suits and pantsuits and skirts. And, and, and Isabel seemed very intimidated. And I even felt a little intimidated because I was nervous about this. And they said that this was her interview. And they went around the room, and each person said who they were. I graduated from such and such a veterinary school in Colorado. I graduated from such and such a veterinary school at Cornell. And then they said, Isabel, can you tell us about yourself? And my wife and I were both sweating because we figured that Isabel would say what she always says when asked to tell about herself, which is that she loves animals, or she loves SpongeBob, and you know the things that really make her happy. And she said, um, my name is Isabel Grinker, and I'm full of autism. <laughs> and people laughed. 
people laughed there. Why? Because they'd never heard this phrase before. They'd never heard it. I mean, full of autism, what does that mean? Uh, well, what it meant to us was that she saw autism as something that was central to her, that defined her, but in a positive way. I mean, to say I'm full of autism is not to say I have a challenge, I have a problem, I have a weakness, I'm damaged, or anything like that. It was to say, this is something that you need to know about who I am, and I'm actually proud of it, and that's what makes me good with animals. So what happened to make this possible? What happened to make it possible that we could get to a world now where somebody in rural South Africa is getting a pretty accurate diagnosis? And by the way, Big Boy's now at the Alpha School in Cape Town, where he's getting really great, or Vera School, where he's getting great education um, for his, given his disability, um, because of that diagnosis. And my daughter um, is seeking to get some kind of veterinary assistant degree. Um, what happened in the world? Well, that's one of the things that I'm interested in as an anthropologist. Uh, I'm less interested in studying things like uh, like you study here, which is you know ba the, the pathways and basic uh, processes of cognition, then what it is about our society and culture that changes to make it possible for people to embrace a new category and to have that category's meaning change over time. So there is today a wave of autism awareness in the world a wave of autism awareness that is evidenced by the number of societies that are being established every year, regional, municipal, national societies to promote autism awareness. And we will just expect, we can only expect that this is going to grow because there is so much renewed interest now in looking at diseases that are not <coughs> fatal, diseases that are not going to uh, increase child mortality. 10 years ago, if you went to Uganda and you said, you know, we'd really like to do a study on autism, people would say, but well, we're really worried about AIDS. We're really worried about malaria. But with the decline worldwide in child mortality, there is now the possibility to justify doing research on child development and early child development in particular. In this slide, um, you're, you see uh, all the societies, all the nations in the world that have national autism advocacy organizations. It's pretty impressive. This slide shows you in darker blue all the societies for which we, all the nations for which we have epidemiologic data. So you can see how little we have. Now, I, I should add um, that um, we did add Korea, but I wish Korea was bigger, um, and it would make a bigger dent. But uh, <laughs> actually, it's funny. Um, when I, I show this slide to my 300-person introductory anthropology class, and the, within a split second of showing this slide, this kid yelled out, Vietnam's missing. And I said, how do you know? And he said, because I'm autistic. This is, I, I get a lot of <laughs> autistic kids who take my classes. Um, So nothing from Africa, nothing from, really nothing from South America, nothing from uh, South Asia. We really don't have a, an idea. And, and it's important to understand what the impact is of having so little data internationally. It means that we don't understand whether or not the constellation of symptoms that define autism today are universal, or if that's just an assumption that we make. We don't know if the onset is the same everywhere. We don't know if there are different forms of autism that appear elsewhere. We don't know how the prognosis and trajectory of the disability differs across cultures. And we also don't know how it is that people understand the aberrations in child development that come to be defined in terms of social communication, language, behavioral deficits. So when I say that I study culture, what do I mean? Well, what I'm interested in in culture is how it is that people give meaning to their world and how they give meaning to their world in ways that are public, either through the shared consensus of uh, attitudes and ideas about the world and or as expressed through public institutions like kinship and marriage and economics. So therefore, Medicine is itself a cultural system. 
It's a shared system of meanings and system of symbols. From an anthropological perspective, any diagnosis, whether it's one you can make by looking under a microscope or one you make through the consensus of the American Psychiatric Association about what defines a mental illness, is unstable. It is constituted historically and culturally. What we think of autism now, today, uh, it will not be the way we think about autism 10 years from now or 20 years from now. That will shift. The only way it could remain static is if we remain static as a society. And of course, that will not happen. Look at Asperger's disorder. So was that some real disorder that existed, and then now it doesn't, and it went away? No. What happened was that things changed to make it possible for us to reconceptualize autism in a way that, by consensus, experts now consider to be a better way. Why is that? I mean, I, my, my own feeling is that Asperger's was a really important disorder for a while. It was important because it provided a less stigmatizing way for people to talk about autism at a time when autism was so highly stigmatized. But the science, of course, didn't hold that up because Asperger's disorder didn't turn out to be defensible as a distinct phenotype. Anyway, the point being that new frameworks, and this is true for science as a whole, are not always necessarily advances over old frameworks, but reflect the way in which we give meaning to our world. In other words, it's all about culture. This is an important point, I think, because we tend to think about culture as the thing that those other people have. Like, the anthropologist studies the pygmies in Central Africa because he studies culture. And so that's, but there's just as much culture right here in this room. And we often don't reflect on our own culture. One of the great uh, uh, secrets of anthropology is that we don't just study other cultures. We study other cultures in order to gain perspective, to return change to ourselves, and, and see our own world in a new perspective. And, and I think that's what uh, the Surgeon General meant in 2001 when he wrote, in uh, the report on mental health disparities, culture is a conception not limited to patients. Clinicians and service systems naturally immersed in their own cultures have been ill-equipped to meet the needs of patients from different backgrounds. So it's not just the patients that have the burden of, 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 of culture. It's also the institutions themselves and the physicians themselves. So if we were to go back and look at the origins of the concept of autism, we would see that there are numerous changes that take place, but they're not necessarily determined by scientific advances, but by social, cultural, historical forces that work in concert to change the way in which we define children with social communication language deficits. Let's look at the first usage of autism by the American Psychiatric Association. It was under the category of schizophrenic reaction. Very little has, is written about the DSM-1. Uh, most people have never seen a copy of it. In fact, so few people pay attention to the DSM-1. If you Google autism DSM-1, I think you come up with my book, it's, you know, <laughs> because there's nothing else. That's the only, like, the only hit you get. Um, but the term autism was used in the late 1800s. It was used to refer to what we now consider to be the negative symptoms of schizophrenia, the withdrawal, lack of affect, introversion. And so autism was thought in the 1950s to be the early manifestation of what would become schizophrenia. In other words, childhood onset schizophrenia. And the files of, of the pioneering psychiatrists Stella Chess and Loretta Bender at Bellevue contain hundreds of cases of children who have diagnoses of childhood schizophrenia, a disorder that is now thought to be one of the most rare mental illnesses in the world, childhood onset schizophrenia. The second uh, uh, usage was in 1968, in which autism only appears in its adjectival form as autistic, atypical and withdrawn behavior. Now, along the same historical trajectory, we find that autism was viewed much more narrowly than it is today. 
Leo Connor, for example, was not interested in diagnosing autism in children who had any intellectual uh, disability. He thought children with autism were all of average or above average intellectual ability. He wasn't interested in diagnosing anyone with autism who had anything but idiopathic autism, meaning that if there was a cause to be identified, you would not give the diagnosis. So children with seizure disorders tended not to have a diagnosis of autism. Children with mental retardation didn't. And if there was any particular reason that could be identified to, um, that would present with some of the symptoms of autism in a clinical interview, like Down syndrome or, C or cerebral palsy um, or fragile X. I mean, that would not have been uh, in the ballpark. So the point is that autism was defined narrowly. In terms of its social uses, it was also defined narrowly because Connor's patients, the first 11 that constitute his description of autism in 1943, were white, educated, middle, upper middle class children. Four out of the 11 fathers in his case report where he first describes autism as a syndrome were psychiatrists. <laughs> I mean, that's definitely a selection bias. Um, the others were lawyers, chemists, and so on. And so what happened in this country was that minority groups, in particular African Americans, had a very difficult time getting a diagnosis of autism. There's a woman named Dorothy Groomer who spoke to the producers of the film Refrigerator Mothers, who I think can say it better than I can. And I just want to give you a little clip from this movie because she's, uh, uh, she's just a, a very engaging uh, figure and it's better than my text. When Stephen was not even two years old, I was at the library, and the librarian said something about, uh, 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 we have some books here. You, uh, would you like to read something on autism? You know? And he said, autism? The little things according to this book seem to identify with Stephen. The rigidity, the repetitiveness, the next time I was at the doctor's office, I asked if uh, he thought Stephen had autism. And it was more than one doctor at that time. It was a team of them over at the University of Illinois. And they said no, that uh, it may be an emotion disturbance, but it's not autism. We did not fit the mold. We did not fit the classic mold for autism, which is white, upper middle class, and very, very bright. Jimmy is an autistic child, 11 years old. His father is a specialist in nuclear power plants. Joseph is seven years old. Both of his parents are college graduates. His father is a college professor. It was really not a negotiable issue. According to my doctors, my son could not be autistic. Uh, I was not white, and it was assumed that I was not educated. Therefore, he was labeled emotionally disturbed. The most recent CDC statistics, based on their records reviews from numerous states in the United States, we find that there's an increase among black and non-Hispanic children of 42.1% and Hispanic children 29.1%. The media depicted this as alarming that there was such a, a big jump in the rate of children with autism. I looked at these statistics and call me a Pollyanna, but I said, oh good, they're getting diagnosed now. They're getting the diagnoses that they did not get in the past so that maybe they can get more appropriate services. Because autism has a meaning now that it didn't have before. It has a value and attraction that it didn't have before. And if anybody knows the work of David Mandel, you will know that there are huge differences in the American population in terms of age of diagnosis. And, and, and it is well, uh, well understood and generally agreed upon that the sooner you intervene, the sooner you offer services, the better uh, the outcome. And uh, we know that near poor children are, are averaging uh, diagnosis a year later than children at 100% over the 
uh, poverty level. We know that rural children and African American children are still diagnosed with autism six months to a year and a half later than their white counterparts. Any diagnostic term is only going to work if it has meaning. I interviewed pediatricians in New Delhi who had no interest in diagnosing autism because it had no meaning for them. They understood what autism was, but there was no service under that category. There was no knowledge within the school systems of that category. In fact, the government had never, not until a few years ago, had they ever uttered the word in any document, uh, autism. So uh, there is not a possibility for a mental illness category or a disability category to have any traction or take hold unless there is some usefulness to it. And that's an important thing to think about when it comes to the United States and understanding the growth of the term autism, that increasingly the word autism is useful. And increasingly, clinicians are saying, rather than be a slave to the DSM, perhaps I need to worry first about what service is necessary and find what diagnosis will drive those services. And that diagnosis that drives many services these days is autism. As an anthropologist, I am interested in overdetermination. So I'm not interested in finding, saying, oh, the, there must be just this one cause for the growth in, in cases of autism. There must be this, there are these two causes. But rather that it is overdetermined. And by overdetermined, meaning so many causes that we can't really find a single one or limit it to even a handful of them. That they're all acting in concert in a kind of matrix. And among the changes that have led to the adoption of autism as a popular category are the birth of child psychiatry in the 1950s. How many children could have been identified as having special needs for school before the 1950s? Which is to say, before there became a specialization in looking at child development through a psychiatric lens, and before there was widespread education of children. How many kids were actually educated, say, in 1900? beyond the first few years of school. Deinstitutionalization, which put the burden on communities for figuring out how to handle children and young adults who were coming out of institutions into the community. They required something to be done, and that required a classification. The rise of advocacy, which begins with AIDS advocacy, disability rights and the IDEA with the autism category coming in in the 1991-92 school year for the first time basically begging to be filled with children who had been previously given other categories. And the decline of psychoanalysis for the study of children, which had created so much stigma among parents who were blamed for all sorts of psychopathology, that they had not attached to their children in a way that had promoted healthy development. So the kind of take home message here is that psychiatric concepts, whether it's autism or something else, interact with a matrix of institutions and practices. And we have to understand how, when we give a diagnosis, that diagnosis then becomes the justification to train people and to produce diagnosticians and to produce people who are giving treatments and who are educating children. And they rely on that diagnosis for their very existence. They build institutions, real and figurative institutions that they occupy. And they have therefore, in effect, created a new kind of person, the autistic person, the person with attention deficit disorder, the bipolar child. These are new kinds of people that are not people who emerge out of stable categories, but people who emerged out of a very complex web of processes. One illustration of the way in which we see these sorts of dramatic uh, changes in the application of a diagnosis is in the state of Minnesota, where James Gurney looked at a single cohort in 1989. And in this single cohort, over time, the autism rate continued to increase, actually even into the ages of 15 and 16. 
autism by definition emerges by 36 months. Do we actually believe that someone at age nine was, being, was, was contracting autism or developing autism for the very first time? Or that somebody at age 11 or 13 or 15 was getting autism for the first time? How many of you know someone who's 45 who was just diagnosed with autism? These kinds of applications of diagnoses tell us less about incidence or prevalence than they do about the society that has come to find meaning in a particular category. I was in, um, at the uh, University of Minnesota giving a talk not long ago. And it was being broadcast on the radio. And they asked me if there was any particular type of person I wanted in the audience that I could choose. And I said, well, make sure to have autistic adults in the audience. And at the end of the talk, a parent of a young child with autism raised his hand and said a little bit ir irritatedly, a little angrily, there must be an epidemic of autism because I, don't, I never see adults with autism. I only see all these kids with autism. I never see adults. And it was like magical. I wish I could bottle this moment. But one by one, these adults stood up and they said, I'm autistic. And another adult stood up and said, I'm autistic. And it was this sort of wonderful, beautiful moment in which uh, I didn't have to say anything. Uh, but it was well understood that these people were there. They were out there. In fact, the research that has been conducted on adults with autism suggests very strongly that there are many people who would have qualified for an autism diagnosis, but didn't because they were born and raised at a time when the diagnosis did not have meaning. The very idea of autism now is hard to pin down. Whether we want to say it's used promiscuously, or that it's empty in its content, or that it's, um, uh, it is a, a category that covers so much that it's lost much of its meaning, you know, that's open to debate. But the reality is that today autism means so many more things than it used to. Who would think that this lovely young woman was autistic? She was a contestant on the show America's Next Top Model. And when she introduced herself to millions of people, she said, my name is Heather, whatever her last name was, and I have Asperger's, which is a kind of autism. I mean, that was an extraordinary thing for me to see. And it had a big impact, I think, on a lot of young viewers. I only know this anecdotally by talking to my students. I teach between three and 500 students uh, every year. And they loved the show, and they talked about this. And we, it was a good topic for conversation, because we could ask the question, what's happened to make it possible that somebody feels comfortable saying that they have autism? How could they, say, could they have said that? 20 years ago in a, on national television and described themselves. Maybe they would never have even had that diagnosis. But it was a great topic of conversation. Sometimes these little changes can actually have very big effects. And sometimes they can have big effects in societies that really need them. In South Korea, autism is highly stigmatized. It's highly stigmatized in part because it's conceived as a genetic disorder. And therefore, if a child has autism, that child impugns the family line. It threatens the marriage prospects of the autistic person's siblings. Koreans will say that it even threatens the house value in which the child lives, or the promotion prospects of the parents. Parents prefer, instead of using the concept of autism, to use a concept that roughly means lack of love, at least it's glossed that way, but would translate directly to the DSM concept of reactive attachment disorder. The mother takes the bullet. She says, I didn't attach to my child. I was a bad mother. Therefore, there's nothing wrong with my children. There's nothing wrong with our genes. I was a bad mother. Uh, the reactive attachment disorder diagnosis is given frequently in South Korea at major medical institutions. Uh, and uh, given uh, frequently without any, almost always, without any evidence of pathological caretaking, which is, of course, a DSM criterion. Um, then a maverick independent filmmaker decided that he wanted to make a movie about a young man who was a marathon runner. 
but who had autism. And he, he ran in Special Olympics. And he didn't think anybody would come to the movie, because who would want to see a movie about autism? But it somehow caught on. And one of the reasons that it caught on was because it presented autism in a new way. But even more importantly, it presented the autistic boy's mother in a new way. It presented the mother as a real person, not this imagined, evil, cold, refrigerator mother that, that people thought were producing children with autism, but a real person with real strengths, but also real weaknesses, a complex character. She's really the focus of the movie. And I want to show you a few, few clips from it. Um, in the first clip, the main character, Joan, is a young boy. And his mother is frustrated that he's not talking. And you may see the mom as distraught, a little hysterical. But what Koreans saw was a mother who was engaged, a mother who was the opposite of what they imagined her to be. Joan아, this is what? B. Taraheba. B. Oma Taraheba. B. B. Ga Churuk Churuk Nereyo. Is it what? B. Taraheba. B. B. Ga Churuk Churuk Nereyo. B. Ga Churuk Churuk Nereyo. Taraheba. B. B. Ga Churuk Churuk Nereyo. 어서 말해. 너왜말 못해? 너 뻥어리 아니잖아. 비가 주룩 주룩 내려요. So in this um, uh, this film, uh, we see Joan as a young boy, played by this actor, and then later he's older. And in the second um, scene, I want to show you, um, Joan is um, very concerned about making his, uh, his uh, scheduled appointment with Animal Planet and to watch his television show because he's crazy about animals. And uh, there's something that interesting that, hap that happens in here that I want to point out to you, but I'll, I'll do that after you see the clip. Let's go to the house. Let's go to the house. Hello. Let's go to the 밥 없었지? 엄마가 빨리 해줄게 먹을까? 먹었어. 타월 좀 빨아놨죠? 아빠한테 전화 왔었어. 다음 주에도 못 올라온대. 중원은 자기 할 말만 하고 사라져 버린다. 경숙은 답답한 마음에 한숨을 내쉰다. 동생한테 존댓말 하는 거 아니랬지? 동생한테 존댓말 하면 안 돼. So uh, it's interesting that he, he bows to the brother, because when uh, we were doing an epidemiologic study in South Korea, and we talked to uh, the moms of uh, kids with autism, uh, they would often say that the, the thing that, that they first noticed about their high-functioning children, the ones that, that had language, was that they couldn't use social reference exactly. In many East Asian languages, you have honorifics uh, that index who it is you're talking to. So in Korean, for example, if I'm you know, talking to a little baby, I would say, annyeong, annyeong for hello. Hello, annyeong, annyeong. But if I'm talking to an elder, I have to say something much more elaborate, like annyeong hashimnika. You put these suffixes. And they say, I can't teach my kid to do this. And that was the first sign. I couldn't get him to do it. And he would bow to little kids, and he wouldn't know what to do. And so these social reference you know, it's not in any ADOS or ADI, these honorifics, but it obviously is something that was of concern to Koreans, and I wanted to point that out to you because one of the things we are learning as people do more and more research in international settings is that the things that parents notice are different. In migrant workers, Mexican migrant workers in Immokalee, Florida, picky eating, picky eaters becomes the first thing that people notice. In other places, it's eye contact. In other places, it might be these social reference. And it obviously varies according to the severity of autism as well. In the next clip from this film that I want to show you, but not because I want you to watch the whole movie, but I just, you know, how often do we get exposure um, to uh, international depictions of autism? Um, 
the uh, Cho Wan has been arrested, and he is um, he 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 loves animals, as I said, and he sees somebody with a purse that's a zebra skin, and he touches it, and she thinks he's trying to steal it. Screams, the police get him, they bring him to the station, and then they call the mom to bring him back. I am to the woman who just cheated him. She just said, "I had no one to blame." Sorry. <laughs> 경숙은 얼른 달려가 여자를 거칠게 돌려 세운다. 보호소? 정신병원? 쟤네들이 범죄자야? 그런데 가두게? 정신병자야? 명품이든 짝퉁이든 우리는 전혀 그런 데 관심 없으니까 주둥이 함부로 놀리지 마. 알겠어? 대한민국 자유국가야. 내 아들 내가 알아서 키워. 애 듣는데 못하는 소리가 없어. 야, 다 기억해. 우리 아들 너보다 기억력 100배, 100배 좋아. 좋아. And people clapped. And they clapped, and they, uh, this film became the second largest grossing film in Korea in 2005. What was the context into which this film emerged? There was a school called the Milal School in Gangnam, which is a very fancy area in Seoul. And if you know Gangnam style, you know, that video that everybody <laughs> seems to know, well, it's Gangnam. That's the area. Um, and. Uh, the community didn't want the school there. They did not want the school there because they did not want any their property values to go down. They didn't want their children to see kids with autism or, or, or disabilities. And this was a special ed school that they objected to. They did not want this special ed school in there. And they threw rocks at windows. They cut phone lines. They, they got, finally got the zoning board in that area, that neighborhood, to stop cons the continued construction. And the agreement to complete the building was only made after it was um, agreed upon that the windows would all face the interior so that nobody would be able to look into the building. This is the kind of situation into which this movie entered. And if you went there today, you'd have no clue that any of that stuff ever happened. This is the jewel in the neighborhood. People go there. They vote there. They have meetings there. They have support groups there. They have games and events and have holidays there. People volunteer from the community in the school. It's really an extraordinary thing to see, this dramatic transformation. And it happens right when this movie comes out and, because, and becomes uh, a kind of, uh, 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 kind of a famous topic of discussion that year. Now, one of the things that happened because of the movie was that people started to say, maybe we got more autism here in Korea than we thought. Because they started to have discussions about it. And then you had experts on television saying, yes, Joan is one expression of autism. But just like Dustin Hoffman in Rain Man, that's only one expression. And you have many different presentations. And there is a spectrum. And when I did focus groups in preparation for the prevalence study, people started to say that they felt that there was more autism in Korea than ever before. And that they were, many of them, very glad that we were doing the study because there clearly was an increase in autism. But the thing is, they were seeing it. They had not seen it before. Now they were seeing it. I, I want to show you some slides that, that um, uh, Craig Neuschaffer loves to show. Um, it's of something that we see every day, FedEx. We see it in envelopes, on football fields, in commercials. We see it every day. What we don't often see is this beautiful arrow that's actually in the middle, which I've just shaded for you. But if we go back to the one that's not shaded, what happens now? Your eye goes like a laser beam to that arrow. And you will leave this audience, this, this campus, and you will see the first FedEx arrow that is near you, and you'll say, oh, shoot, that grinker has gotten me, so I can't focus on anything else. But the point is, that arrow was not missing. It didn't just appear. It was there all along. 
but we weren't primed to see it. And there's something important about this. I used a mundane example, right? But, but there's something more fundamentally important about it, which is that what often appear to be changes that are scientific, that are based in uh, a thought to be increases in knowledge, are in fact changes in just the way we see the world. And let me very quickly give you two examples of this. The invention of homosexuality and the invention of two sexes. Before 1892, when the word homosexuality was invented, there was no such thing as homosexuality. Men had sex with men, women had sex with women, all the way back to ancient Greece. But it wasn't separated out as a category, and nobody talked about there being homosexuals because that wasn't a category. You had to wait until the concept of sexuality was developed to come up with that term. In fact, the word homosexuality doesn't even enter the Oxford English Dictionary until 1976. But what happened in the early 1900s when the word homosexuality was introduced is that people throughout England were writing about how many, new, how many homosexuals there were and where did they all come from. <laughs> Up until the late 1700s, there was no separate anatomical nomenclature for the female reproductive anatomy. Because it was thought that there was only one sex in the world. Male. Women were imperfect men. The ovaries were internal testicles. The uterus was an internal scrotum, and so on. It's not to say that there weren't men and women. Everybody recognized that there were men and women in the world. But from a scientific point of view, there was no distinction between two sexes. There was a distinction in the social world between men and women. But they were biologically, fundamentally, Identical. And so you don't get a development of the notion of two fixed sexes until the late 1700s in Western Europe. And before that time, stories abound of people changing sexes or becoming more male or more female. Bloodletting, for instance, made you more female. Running and getting overheated made you more male. How is this possible that there was a shift from homosexuality to, from no homosexuality to homosexuality, from there being one sex to two sexes. That was made possible not by any new scientific discovery, but by changes in the ideas people had about how to organize and classify the world. For homosexuality, it had to do with the idea that our desires were part of an inner disposition that was innate or was part of what's constituted of, our, of an identity. The idea that there was, we had something which was a sexuality. For the sexes, it had to do with the idea that the Industrial Revolution and other social movements demanded that there be a fixed set of behaviors that were appropriate for men and appropriate for women in the new economy. There were no new scientific advances. The anatomists in the one sex world, they had the same anatomy to look at that they did in the 1800s or the 1900s, the same gross anatomy. There was nothing different. It was scientific. Uh, it was thought to be scientific, but in fact, there was no scientific discovery. So let's, I think it's just a good idea to kind of step back a minute and say, OK, so we look at this increase in autism in the, in the world uh, through the CDC statistics or through prevalence studies, and ask ourselves, does it really make sense? in terms of any science, let's look at the CDC statistics. A fourfold difference between the lowest and the highest estimates. Do we really think that the difference between Alabama and New Jersey is that big? Or does it have to do with the fact that we're getting our records from places with very different institutional settings? In one case, New Jersey, a high population concentration in areas that have a lot of services, and the records all come from services. Or, and in the second case, a largely rural state where there are few services and provide one, maybe one source of, or, or two sources of records where, rather than multiple sources. So it's important that we understand just how it is that we come to understand something as if it were science, when in fact, what we think is science is really something that has come from that total matrix which is the schools, the, the scientists, the, the 
the clinical practices, the way we view parents, the way we think about de child development, the way we think about institutionalization, and so on. One of the problems, of course, with the concept of autism today is that there is a conflation often, in, at least in the public reception of autism prevalence figures, between phenotype and prevalence, where people say, well, if, if autism is that prevalent, I should be seeing children with severe disorders all the time instead of understanding where the growth of autism cases is coming from, much of which is at the level of very high, high functioning. I remember when I published my book um, on autism, the um, Autism Society of America sent an email to every chapter president saying that my book should, they should ignore my book because uh, it would be impossible for Grinker to be right that there wasn't necessarily evidence of an epidemic, or else we would see these severe behaviors. Imagine my disgust when uh, the uh, Christmas letter came out for um, uh, fundraising, and it was using a quote from my book um, that was positive. It was like, give money. But they, anyway, that's beside the point. So, so what happens, we've, we wanted to ask the question, what happens if we take the um, methods of a total population study? where instead of looking at records, we look at actual human beings. And we don't look at records. We, don't, we try to avoid the bias of that kind of institutional framework for defining what autism is, and actually look at real children. The Centers for Disease Control looks only at records, not at children, actual human beings. Let's, let's, let's use this method. And so what we did was we looked at 7 to 12-year-old children in Ilsan, South Korea. We screened the population by giving the ASSQ, or the Autism Spectrum Screening Questionnaire, to uh, teachers and to parents of all 7 to 12 year olds in that city. Those who were screened positive were then invited for ADOSs, ADIRs, and then a clinical assessment to confirm a diagnosis if there was one suggested by the ADOS and the ADIR. The children who were already in special education schools, the very few that exist, were all automatically considered screen positive. In other words, at, at high risk. The result was that we didn't find the same result as the Centers for Disease Control. Now remember, the CDC estimates based on records for the United States are around a little more than 1%, like 1.14%, something like that. We found 2.64%. 1.89% of that was in the general population sample, meaning the kids who were considered to be the low risk group, just the kids who were in school with no services, no record of services. In fact, two thirds of the ASD cases in the overall sample were undiagnosed and untreated with no record of ever having sought or received any services. We think that this has profound implications for the United States, where it's important for us to do total population studies to see if perhaps the increases in the prevalence rates as estimated by the CDC through their records are just playing catch up. They're not there yet. And so what might look like an increase is really just that they're not getting to a more accurate rate which is more 2% and above. In fact, the CDC and Autism Speaks Together are establishing a study in South Carolina to do just that, and that's underway. One of the things I've been doing recently is looking at um, parents' response to their new kids' new autism diagnoses, and they don't like it, surprisingly, uh, not surprisingly, and are uh, developing a new category which they call border children. Uh, the border child is a child who has an impairment in a single domain, the social, but who is intellectually and behaviorally otherwise uh, fine. Whenever studying autism in any culture, it's important to understand that there are, are a number of factors, in addition to those that I've al already laid out, that affect the way in which we have to do research. People might have a lack of familiarity with clinical assessments. They don't know what to do with a 
questionnaire. They don't understand the terms we use. It's an enormous challenge to do international research. And it is amazing to me, incredibly um, exciting to me, that we have studies out there that are being done in South Africa now, in Uganda, in Argentina, in Taiwan, uh, that, that, that had not been done before. In South Africa, for example, Amy Weatherby has been looking, and I've been involved with the study, has been looking at how it is that we can identify young children with autism. And you have to use different methods. You have to go through the witch doctors, or you have to go through the, the plural medical care system in order to understand how to identify children who might be at risk for autism. You have to, for example, go to HIV clinics and AIDS clinics, where often there's a problem. Often the parents are there, but often if the child is HIV positive, there's a confounding effect where sometimes um, HIV or AIDS in children can appear with, uh, can present with some neurodevelopmental um, disabilities or um, deficits. Now, in light of all of this, in light of the way that we look at autism and our understanding of it in terms of culture, we always have to come back to the individual child. And in this case, my daughter, Isabel, for me, that's the, you know, the person that I first think of. And this was her when she was uh, about seven years old, I think. And um, she's in um, France um, at uh, Giverny. And um, I look at her, and one of the things that always strikes me is that she doesn't look disabled that she doesn't look like somebody who is damaged. She doesn't look like somebody who's sick. And yet much of the discourse that has come in the United States, come out in the United States in recent years, has been that kind of discourse. That autism is a tragedy. That the increase in diagnoses of autism is not an achievement that is providing services for people that never got them or who had misdiagnoses, but rather that there is something dangerous, something bad going on. It could be. It could be there's something bad going on. It could be that there's a true increase in the incidence of autism. We don't know. But as an anthropologist, you know, I'm more concerned with what the meanings are. And one of the things that has concerned me, and I wanted to just spend five minutes or so commenting on this, is the idea that there's some evil out there or something bad out there. And there are two places in which I've seen this most paramount. The first is in the outreach efforts of some psychiatric institutions to encourage treatment, and the second is in anti-vaccine discourse. Actually, there's a third, which is memoirs, parent memoirs. But let's just look at a couple of things here. This was the, the New York University Child Study Center outreach. It was called the Ransom Notes ads. What's being said here? What's being said here is that autism is a, these were on billboards, by the way, not billboards, on bus kiosks in Manhattan. What is being said here is that your child has been stolen. Your child has been lost. Something's come and taken your child. I look at that picture of Isabel, and I don't think anybody's, anything's been taken from her. I see my child. I see who she is. I don't see that there's something that was lost or taken or damaged. Maybe that's just the dad in me talking. But I also think that as an anthropologist, I want to be critical of these kinds of attitudes. Now, the anti-vaccine. Anti-vaccine, that's old. That's as old as vaccines. <laughs> Here is an envelope from 1879, an anti-vaccine campaign. The government has come to take the child through its vaccines. The vaccines are actually killing children by order, by proclamation of the government. Here's the vaccine revolt in Brazil in 1904, in which the workers were convinced that the government was seeking to eradicate them through vaccines, that the vaccine program was a way to destroy them, to kill them. Here is 
The Introduction to Strange Sun by Portia Iverson, an advocate who started Cure Autism Now, which then merged with Autism Speaks. One day it happened. He was gone. Now, if you are an anthropologist, and if you are thinking about the United States and these discourses, not just as isolated to this continent, but as fitting into a larger pattern than we see, well, then it's absolutely fascinating. In Indonesia, people are convinced that children are killed and their body parts are placed at the cornerstones of new buildings to give those buildings power and to enhance the power of the state. In South America, US embassies are almost daily provided with rumors that children have been abducted their organs have been taken and transported to the United States for transplantation into a rich American child. What do all of these things have in common? It is that the child becomes imagined as vulnerable, the object through which adult subjectivities can be imagined and performed. The child is, in, is, in, is not complete. The child is vulnerable. The child is innocent. The child is weak. And that child, therefore, becomes open to symbolic meaning and even symbolic exaggeration. One of the things that I think autism advocates and parents need to do with this knowledge of the way in which external forces are imagined to impinge upon our children and change them and destroy them or steal them is to see what impact that has on the depiction of those children themselves and perhaps even their self-esteem. There is a book I want to um, promote to you. It came out yesterday, and it's by Andrew Solomon. And I devoured it. It's a, I, I got it before yesterday, so it's 900 pages. Um, it is a superb book, but he makes the point that what we come to think of as a disability isn't necessarily something that has to be blamed on some external force. And that our imagination of something typical or normal is really illusory. That the typical is really rare, lonely, abnormal. But I think it's best stated by an autistic self-advocate, Jim Sinclair who wrote, we need and deserve families who can see us and value us for ourselves, not families whose vision of us is obscured by the ghosts of children who never lived. Grieve if you must for your own lost dreams, but don't mourn for us. We're alive. We're real. And we're here waiting for you. I think this is an important message. I think it's one that we should all take to heart, that when we talk about autism, we're also talking about culture. We're also talking about ourselves. This is uh, very illuminating. Uh, are there restrictions uh, uh, in our laws that uh, automatically prohibit uh, uh, licenses like driving, cars, uh, automatic uh, prohibitions in our society for that? For autism? Yeah. I don't think so. No, I don't, I don't think so at all. I think that one of the interesting things about the, our, our recent years is that people with what is sometimes called high-functioning autism are capable of doing professions that didn't exist in the past. And so with technological change, particularly in Silicon Valley, you kind of re see a reconfiguration of disability where the disability becomes positively valued as a, a capability, as an achievement, as, a, as something that is an ability. I think Temple Grandin is a case in point where this is a woman who, through her autism, at least this is her perspective, through her autism, she's been able to not only be a successful advocate, but to be a veterinarian, published researcher, and half the beef processed in the United States is processed through plants that she designed. And she's autistic, and she credits autism with it. So with technological and social change, we see a reconfiguration. It's, it's, it really is it, it's the true revenge of the nerds, if you remember that movie. Yeah. But do you think that is new? Maybe they did have a functioning society previously, too, like they're repetitive 
find that they did certain jobs that required that, those qualities? Well, the, you know, that you do read um, people occasionally positing whether Einstein, Isaac yeah. Newton, and so on were autistic. Who, who knows? Yeah, you can't really do that. <laughs> right, who knows? But, but one of the things that, that you do find in rural settings, in developing countries, is that, especially where there's no kind of obsession that when you're 21 you need to live an independent life in your own apartment or something, um, that, that, that there's a place for adults with autism. That when the child grows up, there's a place for them. They can stay with you. They can do some kind of job. Uh, I mean, when I was in downtown Seoul, nobody knew the autistic kid in apartment 123. That, pa those parents hid that child. But when I went out to rural mountain villages, where there was a kid with autism, everybody knew him. In one, one place, the 16-year-old delivered the mail, because he didn't know where everybody lived, but he knew where everybody was at every particular point in time. And he'd find them, and he'd go give them their mail. And he had a role. Um, the WHO studies, the WHO studies of schizophrenia do suggest that the prognosis of schizophrenia, the, the severity of, of, of um, is better, the severity and frequency of psychoses is less in places where uh, you, you do have rural developing um, communities, maybe because those social supports are there. And I was telling the fellows earlier when I had lunch with them that I, if you look at the psychiatric literature, it's pretty much the number one factor in determining good prognosis or better outcomes is if there's social support. And so, you know, you could go back to epidemiologic studies of schizophrenia in the 1920s that were done in New York or Chicago, and you'd find that people with schizophrenia um, who are doing poorly are living all alone in boarding houses and on the street. Um, whereas uh, Kim Hopper from Columbia University and Nathan Klein Institute has shown that um, people with autism in India are working fields and they're in factories and, they're, and many of them are marrying. So there may be these extra social supports that contribute. Yeah. I'm wondering what, what kind of change is going on that's allowing them to emerge? Because what I, what I, what I, I think what it is, from my perspective, what I'm seeing is I'm giving them hope. I'm giving them some faith in themselves and giving them that sense of you have a chance, you can make it. Let's, let's see how high we can go with this. Let's show the results and prove to the rest of the world that you're going you're to be OK. But then the, the flip side of it is society isn't making places for them to go when they leave me. And so I'm always trying to figure out where can I create this bridge? And does this bridge even exist? Because their, their labels are slipping away as they walk away from the, you know, the ADAs are not protecting them. The umbrellas are not there to safeguard them when they get thrown out of foster care homes and group homes and institutional programs that I get them in because I'm in a, a restricted setting. Well, I think you, those are great points. Um, and, and I think one of the things, one of the points embedded in, in, in what you said is the importance of seeing autism as a spectrum, but also seeing children as constantly moving. They are moving targets. And the, that's the problem with these categories, because they suggest that they're stable. right? And even if you were to accept that you have some diagnostic stability, and you could say this person was autistic at age 2, and this person is also autistic at age 20, doesn't mean that they're that same person. There is one of the things that I've, I've seen in my own child is that the, the notion that there was a short window of plasticity in early childhood was uh, an illusion. She made her greatest strides in development at age 18, at, um, at age 19 even. It's extraordinary to see um, how much change there is in, in adults. So the, I talk to my wife, and she'll probably tell you I don't change at all, <laughs> um, despite all of her efforts. Um, <laughs> but um, but I, I mean, I think that's really an important, important point that we understand. And the problem with IEP meetings often is that sometimes people aren't as understanding as you are, and that educators will say, well, wait a minute. You were asking for this accommodation last year, and now you're asking for a different one what's going on? And you're like, well, the child's not the same as they were a year ago. But I think, the, I think that there's good evidence now, a lot of it coming out of the research done here, of the effect of treatment and intervention plans. And those are having an impact. And I, I, I'm not sure, 
I, I certainly agree with you that there are not a lot as 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 many spaces or or spots for people um, when they come out of uh, and they're not on that special ed radar anymore after age 21. But there's so many more than there used to be. There are colleges now. I never t had anybody in a classroom that was autistic till the last few years. Now I've got these kids with autism. I mean, it's in part because they seek me out. They figure that I'll be really you know, understanding and I'll know about them. But we've got them on the books now. We've got them. Now, a lot of them still like to use the term nonverbal learning disorder. But we, still, we have a lot of autistic people on the books. And there are autistic people at Yale and at GW. And like my 21-year-old daughter, who's now taking classes at a community college, there are autistic people. And the supports are extraordinary. When, I, when, it, when, it was, when Isabel was young, I would tell people she had autism, and they'd freak out. They'd look confused or uncomfortable. Now they don't blink an eye. That's the achievement here. I know that the media like these negative statements, but I just see so much positive in the effect of all of the research infrastructure and all of the clinical work and the educational work and so on that has come over the past decade or two to really help give people an opportunity to participate and be integrated in their communities in a way they couldn't have before. I have a clarification question and then an actual question. Um, when you were mentioning that the jewel of the city in South Korea, the special education school, that now it was now it had become the jewel and that wasn't the case before. Was that because of the movie? Yeah, I, I mean, with what I, w I hoped that I was saying, and I probably wasn't clear enough, was just that the, the, the movie then instigated a whole lot of discussion in the media and articles. And then celebrities started to come out and say that they had autistic children. And so there was a, a kind of movement toward greater openness. Now, I don't think that anybody's where they need to be um, yet. <laughs> but in comparison, in comparison to the pre-marathon days, um, I think it's, it's really a world apart. And so my actual question, that was just a clarification, is um, myself as an occupational therapist, and I have the opportunity to work with all types of individuals and ages, but specializing mostly in uh, children with an autism spectrum disorder. My question is, is how, as an interventionist, do I create a balance between the some of the movements, I don't know, you're probably familiar with the claymation out of Australia called Mary and Max, where the concept is don't try to fix me, you know, which mm -hmm. Max with, you know, a, a grown adult male, a diagnosis of Asperger's, and there's that concept of don't try to fix me. And I'm hearing you say, you know, that sense of let's just be accepting. My question is, how do I then support and intervene when there's, even as an adult, resistance to change, and then have the same concept of acceptance? It's very complex. And I Right. I think, I think what you're really keying in on is an important point, yeah. which is, does acceptance mean you don't treat? No. <laughs> it doesn't. Um, acceptance means you um, understand the person in a way that, as a, a psychoanalyst would say, is not a self-object. You don't look at them narcissistically. My child is not a narcissistic injury to me. I accept that my child is who my child is. And I know my child is capable of doing X, Y, or Z if only I can help my child in a team with everybody else on the team to succeed. But acceptance is really not about saying, oh, you're just fine the way you are. Well, obviously, people don't have to change if they don't want to. But nobody in our study in South Korea, for example, was diagnosed in our study with autism if they weren't suffering. They didn't have friends, had difficulty with transitions, had difficulty focusing on the things that they weren't interested in at school, had, if they didn't have difficulty with the fluorescent lights, if they didn't have difficulty with some of the spatial organization of the classroom and changes and things like field trips and guest lectures in which they would have serious problems. They were suffering. But the question is, is this person to be addressed as a person in and of themselves who has strengths and weaknesses, or is this person a reflection of me? Andrew Solomon says, we don't, re we don't really reproduce. We produce. 
we don't produce people just like ourselves. We produce people who are different from ourselves. And whether your child is nonverbal or your child is um, able to go, say, to a community college, um, that child has value and that child has worth in and of themselves apart from what it says about you. That's the point. I just wanted to get clarified. Um, I really enjoyed your lecture, by the way. Thank you very much. Um, you were saying that the, the population study you did in South Korea, um, that autism rates had increased, or I guess the norm now is the 2.4%, uh, and, and the CDC says it's only 1.4 here in the States. Is there a movement? I know you were talking about the, the South Carolina study that's going to be coming up. It feels like it's, we're so um, delayed in this research findings. Because I've often, I, I'm taking a class now with children with special needs, and it, two years ago, I had a son with autism, or on PDD, so on the spectrum. And it was, back then, it was, I was at one in 136 children had autism, and now it's I don't remember the numbers, but it's so much increased that I was thinking, how can this be? But it sounds to me like what you're saying is they never were diagnosed or as much before, and now you think that will be yeah, so, more real reality of the trial? So, so there are a lot of, of um, a lot of things in your question, but let me just emphasize that the South Korean study wasn't an increase from anything because there'd never been an assessment. There'd never been a prevalent study of autism in South Korea. Um, I don't think we're behind in the United States at all. Um, I just think that we need to add this different method, which is problematic for an organization like the Centers for Disease Control. Doing a total population study is very expensive and takes a long time, years and years and years. Um, the CDC is, a gov or is part of the US government, and the government wants statistics more quickly. And they are using a particular method, which is to look at the records in the service sector in the United States. And those are important data. But I'm not sure that they count as epidemiologic data in the same way that you find in other epidemiologic studies, like the one we did in South Korea. They do tell us about trends in services, trends in record keeping, trends in reporting. They don't necessarily tell us about prevalence, actual prevalence trends. That's, that's the point. They're, they're valuable for what they are, right? But they can't be taken as a substitute for a much more thorough analysis. I mean, it is remarkable that we don't have an incident study of autism. We really don't have any kind of decent incident study, which is different from prevalence. Prevalence is the rate of, of the distribution of a, of, of a disorder in a particular population. It's a rate, percentage, the number with the disorder divided by the, um, uh, the, total pop the denominator, the total population, and incidence is the rate of new cases over time. Well, just think how hard it is to do studies of new cases over time with a disorder that has its onset at before 36 months. Uh, very, very difficult to do. Um, we also don't have any prevalence studies that are um, very good that, about adults. And that's not surprising. Are any speech pathologists here? Yeah, imagine you wanted to do a prevalence study of lisps or speech impediments. How would you do it? Where would you find them? Once people are adults, as you put it, you know, they're off the radar. They're in there. You can not go around on some streets and knock on the door. Anybody here got a speech impediment? But lots of people with speech impediments don't even know they have speech impediments. Tom Brokaw. <laughs> you know, so, uh, so, so uh, uh, at the, once you, when you've got kids, it's easier at least, because they're at desks. They're on school rolls. But. Hi, yes. I worked as a school psychologist in the Chicago urban and suburban schools for 10 years, and I've read a lot about autism. I diagnosed some children with it. And two things I read I'd like you to comment on. One is a description of people with autism as having a super male brain. Uh, the other one is um, saying that um, couples in which the um, husband is older tend to have a greater 
prevalence of children with autism. I'm wondering if either one of these concepts holds water uh, as far as you're concerned. Well, it's a really complicated question because you're asking me to give you my perspective on two totally different types of studies. So what I can say about it is that um, the, the idea of the male brain, it comes largely from the work of Simon Baron Cohen in England, um, who's an incredibly prolific and interesting, creative, provocative researcher, um, whose research is, um, is very much guided by an evolutionary psychology approach that is somewhat related to sociobiology, but is really looking at what might have occurred to the brain in human evolution. Whereas the other study is looking at the effect of a new social pattern and the effect of um, mutations that occur over the lifespan of a man. Um, and there's also studies about the age of mothers as well. So they're completely different studies. Um, and one is, a, one is a very theoretical study. Uh, the other one is uh, a very much an evidence-based um, epidemiologic study. They're very, very different. Um, I think they both have incredible value. Um, I would say that I'm a little more suspicious about the evolutionary psychology approach um, simply because um, there, seem to be, there seems to be evidence for, um, uh, for the male bias in autism that involves uh, not necessarily evolution, but, but specific pathways in the brain. Um, and so uh, nothing, not as much to do with the brain as much to do with um, what's happening at the genetic level. So you know, I'm not an expert on that, but that's sort of my perspective. I think one is theoretically interesting and provocative, um, as much sociobiology is. Uh, the other uh, has been you know, pretty solid evidence-based epidemiologic work on the age of parents. And it makes a lot of sense to do that work. And I, one reason it makes a lot of sense to do it is because it adds the question of environment. Right? What, when you're talking about um, the age of parents, uh, you're talking about uh, how things change with exposure in the world and environment. And I think that's incredibly valuable, uh, especially uh, for a country that has focused so much on environment as if environment equaled toxin as opposed to the world we live in. The UC Davis Mind Institute was created in 1998 with the promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. Their groundbreaking research on autism, Fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other brain disorders are helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website to find out more about current studies upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.